Thank you, Stephen. Well, friends, we have made it to the end of our spooky sermon series, Tales from the Script. And i got to tell you that throughout this month of October, I've been reminded exactly why we don't hear too many sermons about these obscure and downright problematic biblical stories. I'm looking forward to putting these back into the filing cabinet uh, where they can remain for many years to come. I'll tell you that. But not until we explore one more really interesting story, maybe even my favorite, out of the mix. Before we dive into it, though, let's be in prayer together, shall we? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds to you and your good news, today and every day. Amen. Today's unusual tale begins with a death. The death of the spiritual leader of the people of Israel, Samuel, the prophet, the priest who guided the people for years before they decided that they would rather have an earthly king like all their neighbors did. And so they traded their heavenly hope for King Saul. If you'll indulge me for just a minute, though, given the context of our time, it feels important to note that the Israel of the biblical text in both the Old and New Testament, ancient Israel as it has been called, is not the same as the modern state of Israel. We could get into the weeds of ancestry, but for now just know that perhaps while that region of the world is largely the same, the makeup of the people and their ethnic and religious ancestry has morphed and evolved and changed in these last three to 4,000 years. People of ancient Israel are known as Israelites, and it is a purely ancestral term. The people of the modern state of Israel are known as Israelis, and that is a term of citizenship. It's a complicated history in this area of the Middle East, and that is what adds to the difficulty of navigating a peaceful way forward. But let me say this, regardless of what people in that region are called today, they all, regardless of citizenship or ethnicity or religion, should be free to live blessed, beautiful, and empowered lives without the fear of war and death or genocide hanging over their heads. Having said that, let's get back to our story of ancient Israel, the Israelites. At the outset of, of that story that Stephen read for us, just after we are told of Samuel's death and the great mourning that accompanied his passing, we are told almost as an aside, this little insert into the story, that King Saul, the very first king of the Israelites, had expelled all mediums and wizards from the territory of the ancient Israelites. But that little aside becomes important as the narrative continues, doesn't it? Sometime later, the Israelites were surrounded by the enemy Philistine armies waiting to lay siege to their territory. Now, I don't know about you, but as a kid... There were two things that I, well, many things really grow, growing up the way I did, but two main things that I was terrified of as a child. One was quicksand, and the other was the Philistines. Every cartoon, if you're a church kid, you know what I'm talking about, right? Every cartoon made quicksand out to be not only the most dangerous element on the face of the planet, but also the most prevalent. And then every Sunday school lesson of my youth, it felt like we learned a brand new lesson about how the invading Philistines wish nothing more than to murder and eliminate God's people. And as it turns out, as an adult, neither of those two fears were relevant in any way whatsoever in my life or probably in yours. But for Saul, that second one certainly was legit. In fear of total annihilation, Saul goes to God using every traditional method of communication. Prayer, 
fasting, begging God to intervene, consulting the prophets, even using the Urim of the high priest. Do you know what the Urim of the high priest is? No? Well, in Hebrew, Urim means lights. And according to classical rabbinical culture, the Urim was something that was placed into the breastplate of the uniform worn by the high priest. There's a photo here, a, a drawing of what the Urim might look like. Now, in order for the Urim to give an answer, the one asking the question of Yahweh would stand facing the fully dressed high priest in his, in his costume, in his outfit, and vocalize the question briefly and in a very simple way. The high priest would stand with their back facing the questioner and with their face toward the Ark of the Covenant. And they would, after the inquirer would ask their question, Yahweh would take over the being, the shell of this high priest, and they would be moved to, artic to see some letters protruding in light from the Urim that was on their breastplate. In the process, communicating with the holy, an answer to whatever question was being asked. Now Saul had attempted all these steps, but to no avail. God was apparently not on speaking terms with the king. And out of desperation, Saul sought the wisdom of what the NRSV calls a medium. Some translations call her a witch, and that is how she has historically been perceived. She was successful in reaching the one whose wisdom Saul sought. But the news that the ghost of Samuel delivered was not at all what Saul wanted to hear. Samuel delivered one final prophetic vision of Saul's impending death at the hands of the waiting Philistines. Now what we didn't read today, simply for the sake of time, but is told in the continuing of the story, is that after Saul received this awful proclamation from Samuel, he was so distraught that he fell down to the ground and could not even summon the strength to stand. For he knew his life was about to end. And that woman from Endor, in that moment she realized it was Saul, the king, who demanded her expulsion from the territory. This woman who had risked her very life to do this work in conference with the king, rather than expel Saul from her home or even run away herself for her own safety, instead she took her one fatted calf and killed it, and cooked it, and fed Saul and his two men with him a meal. She baked bread so they would have a hearty meal. And I don't know about you, but to me that sure sounds an awful lot like the father of that prodigal son that we read, that Jesus told the story about in the Gospels, who we are meant to perceive as God themselves. The witch of Endor feeding the king of Israel who had declared her persona non grata. Now, if you've heard this story before, then you're likely familiar with the version of the retelling of this tale that turns this woman into a Halloween caricature, a witch with ghastly and ghostly powers. In fact, this painting, titled The Witch of Indoor Raising the Spirit of Samuel, is from 19th century English artist William Blake. It isn't difficult to look at that and know what perception we are meant to have of this otherwise unknown woman. Now maybe by casting her in this light and forcing our negative attention her way, maybe we've been blinded to other monsters that creep into our world. As Professor Will Gaffney said in her sermon, The Not a Witch of Endor, monsters in human flesh that ravage, destroy, and desecrate human lives, beating and bloodying children, battering and savaging domestic partners, ravaging the intimate flesh of women, children, trans, and non-binary persons, and even menfolk. Those are the monsters who no cross 
or wooden stake of hawthorn or ash, silver bullet, holy water, or garlic will repel. Those monsters walk among us. And like zombies, they just keep on coming. And their wicked weapons are toxic masculinity, heteropatriarchy, trans-exclusive radical feminism, forced pregnancy, and the demonization of women, our bodies, and our power, she says. One of the tools of the monstrous is to label women with power, powers real and imagined, as witches. Some have called feminists witches for a long time. And if some of them had their way, women who rejected certain biblical interpretations and offered our own would be burned at the stake with the rest of them. Now, never mind that nowhere in the story is the ghost master called a witch. Or does she even practice witchcraft? But she does have power. Power that the men in the story do not have. She has the power to reach beyond the veil of death, where our tradition tells us only Jesus has the power to go and return of his own free will. She has the power to pull back an unwilling soul from the other side. Samuel says, why did you bring me here? She is in the language of her people. In the original Hebrew, it is translated as ghost master. Ghosts do not possess her, or control her. She controls them. Some have labeled her a medium, using the power of translation to minimize her power and make her nothing more than a passive receptacle. Some have even called her a ghost wife. You see, by marrying her to the ghost, they eliminate her mastery. Women who would be accused of the same would be burned as witches pointing to this text and others in equally bad translations. The woman that God-forsaken Saul sought out in his desperation for a divine word was not a witch, but a woman whose very identity had been rendered illegal by him. Now, if you're thinking... Okay, Melody, but the Bible says such divination is wrong. Hear this other word from Reverend Will Gaffney on that expression, but the Bible says. She says, you better run whenever you hear those words. Run like the walking dead are coming after you. Whenever someone tries to take 1,300 years of literature written by different people in different periods for different purposes, edited in separate bundles and tied together in different canons of scripture, so that not even we who are worshiping together in this room have the same number of biblical books in our scriptural table of contents, you better run. She says that is just like witchcraft. When Deuteronomy, what Deuteronomy actually says, friends, is that there should be no one among the ancient Israelites who inquire of ghosts or who is possessed by spirits. And the ghost master of Endor does not fall into either of those two categories. She does not ask a ghost or Samuel not even one mumbling word. She doesn't have to because she is in control. She doesn't have a familiar spirit. She has the power to call up anyone upon request. Apparently, that's a power not even imagined by the author of Deuteronomy. If anyone has violated that Torah statute, who is it? Saul. Not that woman of Endor. But what no scripture ever says is that her power is not real or that her power comes from anywhere, anyone, or anything outside of God. Friends, the ghost master of Endor is God's daughter, created in their holy and divine image with the power that she was born with or the power that she somehow came into upon her maturity. And Samuel, who has plenty else to say to Saul and others, Samuel was kind of a cantankerous guy, 
And if you disappointed God, Samuel was the first person in line to tell you how disappointed God was in you. But Samuel has not a word of rebuke for her. In fact, it was not God who commanded that she and others like her should be driven out of business or underground. It was Saul. What Deuteronomy does say is that those related spiritual practices were not native to Israel, about whom really nothing can be said to be native in that early stage of their formation. But know this about Deuteronomy, where it talks about the prohibition of divination. Deuteronomy is a retrospective, looking back on the Israelite people, hundreds of years past the time in which it was written to represent. And Deuteronomy has a theological ax to grind against the Canaanites and their practices to justify their occupation and settlement of their land. It is a rationale for their colonization. The same rationale that was given for the colonization and occupation of the land on which we sit and stand and pray. The same rationale that decry the native practices of native people in this country as obscene, as anti-Christian, as witchcraft. Now, I'm not advocating for discarding the text or dismissing it outright, but I am advocating for a questioning of the text so that we might better understand it for ourselves. Asking questions like, who benefits from this story written this way? Where is the holy in it? Where does God show up? What are we to perceive for ourselves from it? Those are the questions we should bring to the scripture. I want to return one more time to the words of Will Gaffney. She says, the Torah of the woman who walks between worlds and sees far beyond the veil is that the world is wider and stranger than we know or than what many of us are made to feel comfortable. She says the power of God is wider than this world and its divisions, bigger than its labels and boxes and closets. Friends, the love of God is greater than all of that and all of us. Love is stronger even than death. The love of God is so far-seeing and far-reaching that it partnered with a woman that many would have called a witch for her story of being impregnated by the Holy Spirit of God. When Jesus reached through the veil between life and death and brought back children to their parents, many said he was a magician. When Jesus healed the sick and caused the lame to walk again, the people said, what sorcery is this? But you and I read those stories now and we know that it was nothing more than the power of God at work in Jesus the Christ. If God is who we say God is, then the power of this woman of Endor and others like her is no threat. Instead, it is those who call women witches while chopping, kindling that we ought to be concerned about. It is those who seek to burn what God has lovingly created that should shake us to our core. It's a danger of putting God in a box and limiting what is possible with the powers of God's spirit residing on all of humanity is that we then create monsters of each other. God is limitless. God is capable of making space. God is expansive and capacious. God is not puritanical and small-minded. So why then are we? Christians, throw wide the gate of understanding to an even more expansive faith that does not limit God but that makes room for even, no, not even, especially the witches among us. Thanks be to God.
Amen.